the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Hey guys, Peter Franson here from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. Right now I'm going to attempt to examine the Bible and dissect some of the churchy language we can really easily take for granted, digging into history and languages as I'm able anyway to try and get at the heart of the text so that we can hopefully see and then apply at least some of what God has for you and me in these words today. Now I am not formally trained in scripture, I'm just a guy using resources and a questioning mind to try and get at the truth, and that's something that we can all do, so I hope that you'll do that with me. We are continuing our study through the book of Ephesians, and I've arrived now at chapter 2. We're going to take on verses uh, 11 through 22. Uh, A lot to cover. I'm actually not going to do as much like uh, exegesis of the of the text. I'm going to make some kind of broad, more broad comments than usual, cover a little bit more ground than usual, uh, because I realize there's more time I'd want to spend kind of in the application side of things um, this time. Uh, anyway, there's a lot here, though, that uh, unfortunately um, you might feel like, oh, he's not addressing this or touching on this or dissecting this detail. There's kind of a broader thing that I think is worth kind of uh, sitting on for a little bit. Anyway, um, so verses 11 through 22 of Ephesians chapter 2 in the ESV says, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Okay, so a lot there. Let's look at just uh, 11 and 12 again. It says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. In light of the fact that No one has grounds for boasting about their good deeds and their new life in Christ. We looked at those verses last time. In light of that, Paul urges his non-Jewish readers, Gentiles, to recognize where they once were in comparison to the new life they have in Christ and the unity they have with Jewish Christians. Um, By superficial standards, circumcision, ethnicity, Gentile Christians were sometimes looked down on by Jewish Christians. Gentiles were born non-Jews and also were generally not raised in an environment that valued Yahweh. Because of this, they also had genuine disadvantages compared to Jews, being far from God out of ignorance. It's not that God was keeping them far away, but they they didn't have uh, an awareness of what God had revealed to humanity through uh, his people Israel. And so that's where they were at being far from God out of ignorance, lacking, as a result, the hope God offered of a promised Messiah, which at least uh, the Jews had. And they were the, the Gentiles were not a part of this uniquely purposed people group um, that God created in, in Israel. Uh, verses 13 through 18, again says, uh, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both, meaning both people groups, one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, 
and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Christ's sacrifice erased genetic and cultural distinctions in terms of one's relationship to God, one's ability to have relationship with God. The numerous laws of the Old Covenant that functioned as a relational medium between Israel and God were made pointless and obsolete for those purposes by Christ's sacrifice. Jesus also removed any reason or excuse for all uh, divisive hostility between people groups. In Christ, all believers are one people group, all with the same access to God through the Holy Spirit a peaceful unity, um, the means for peace being uh, created, brought about by Jesus. Verses 19, and 20, 19 through 22, again, say, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Um, Non-Jews are not travelers passing through or, or foreigners living among God's chosen people as Christians. All believers are both citizens of God's kingdom and members of his household, partnering with God on a close sort of domestic level. The foundation for our unity is the work and sacrifice of Christ as revealed through the apostles and prophets. It's through Christ in community that we have peaceful unity. Uh, it's through Christ in community that we grow in being set apart for God's purposes. And it's through Christ in community that we grow in being the place where the Spirit sort of makes his base of operations on earth. Okay, so what's in all this, maybe specifically for geeks to take away? Notice the fact that our new identity in Christ and significance in his kingdom is all described here in the context of community and not in safe isolation from each other. And it's not a perfect community. There's obviously some, some uh, division, some conflict going on here. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't feel any need to kind of talk about this issue of unity. So it's definitely not a, a perfect community, but it is one in process. Um, we are being joined together and are being built together, the text says, to become a dwelling place for God. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a thing that's in process. This passage is mostly directed at Gentiles, I think, who were the ones being ostracized by Jewish Christians. And so Paul's encouraging words are meant to both encourage Gentile readers and, I think, uh, correct Jewish readers in the church that would read the same text. Uh, and as geeks, we, I think, can really benefit from receiving the intended principles that are for both categories here. As, as geeks, we can be on either the, the giving or receiving end of judgment and separation in Christian community. Um, so first, a few thoughts about the danger of us as geeks mentally or relationally putting up dividing boundaries between us and other Christians. I personally suspect that when we do this, although we may label to ourselves uh, our motivation for doing so as, as righteous, maybe about taking a stand on a doctrinal issue or something like that, I think it's more likely many times motivated in some way that we may, may not even recognize unless we really do some hard self-examination, maybe more likely motivated by, in some way, our, our insecurity and our inability to interact easily with people who think and feel differently from us or who make us uncomfortable. We can develop a quiet uh, sort of us versus them mentality, not even necessarily a combative thing, but just kind of like, well, they're wrong and they're in that line of mode, they're, they're in that mode of thinking, that line of thought, and they're wrong and I'm, you know, I'm over here, I'm in the right mode of thinking, you know, and, and so it's just kind of like we, we, it's, when I say us versus them, it's more about uh, thinking categorically, and so we just tend to not gravitate toward looking for connections with people that are already in a place where they're thinking differently than, than we are, or there's just things about them that are different from the way that we are. And, and uh, so we can kind of quietly, sometimes inadvertently, uh, develop this mentality that contributes to 
a social dynamic that's in direct opposition to the unity we're intended to have through Christ, that we do have in terms of our status, but that we uh, don't enter into experientially by, by our own choice. Uh, I think this is most noticeable online. I think we can probably all recognize that. That's where we can be quick and combative in separating ourselves from uh, even other Christians who have different doctrinal beliefs than we do. But what we kind of boldly express online still feeds a quiet separation in our in-person interactions and relationships, causing us to maybe tense up inside when we realize in a conversation, oh, the believer we're talking to has some very, very different views than we do. Um, good grief. What am I, oh, that's laundry related. Okay, anyway. <laughs> I'll get to that hopefully in a second. Um, but yeah, we can we can still sort of, again, it's not this combative thing. It's, uh, I think it's more this place of tension. We're like, oh boy, they think that about that issue or whatever. And so we just kind of like cut off in our minds like, well, I'm not going to be able to be close to them, you know. Um, and, uh, and really these viewpoints that they have um, were probably developed by virtue of them having a different upbringing a different communal and cultural experience from us and perhaps also you know just from genetic predispositions that they have all these contributing things some that are certainly in their control but others that that aren't um, and so have them in this place where they're believing something very different or thinking or living in a way that's very different from us um, despite these feelings of categorization and separation that we can have uh, what we see in this passage is that division should not happen among Christians on the basis of superficial and uncontrollable elements like birth or upbringing. Um, even though such elements can leave someone with traits that make them hard to be around or to relate to. I think in principle this extends to certain predispositions that may have at least partially genetic origins or culturally ingrained habits and inclinations. Um, if a Christian has a particular disability, addiction, sexual inclination, or unusual personality trait, uh, we need to be ready to welcome spending time and sharing life with them. Now that's not to say that we need to give approval to everything they may do uh, that their predispositions steer them toward. Those with mental health problems or ingrained sinful traits or unbiblical sexual inclinations or addictions or even some disabilities, you know, we should strive to be a part of a, a loving solution, be a loving ally in their lives, to, to love and walk alongside and partner with them, to find solutions that will increase their freedom and capacity to live effectively for Jesus. And a big side benefit we're going to gain is wisdom and perspective found from hearing about the very different struggles and situations uh, of other Christians. Um, now, of course, there's the other perspective that we can experience in which we as geeks are the ones being ostracized among Christians. Um, I think a lot of us can relate to the Gentile situation described here. For superficial reasons, a number of us have been criticized or overlooked in local church communities. I've heard a number of stories from you guys over the years reflecting this, and this can leave us feeling disconnected from our local churches. If we are criticized for our geek hobbies or uh, personality traits, it's very tempting to want to kind of compartmentalize our, our lives in response and keep a sort of secret life that we put all of our geek stuff and our geek enjoyment into that our Christian friends and family just aren't really exposed to just so we can avoid that discomfort or their conflict or whatever. So we enjoy our geek entertainment over here where no one sees, including some entertainment that's legitimately unhealthy for us. That's easily where we can find ourselves uh, if we segment our lives that way. It's a scenario that creates a breeding ground for sin, which is why for both a uh, geek and non-geek Christians, discerning and speaking truth in a persuasive and gracious way is such an important skill to develop so that we can keep lines of communication graciously open and maintain deepening, understanding, meaningful relationships in our Christian communities. Uh, in addition, the Gentiles had an ignorance of God uh, that we can develop as well. They were at a disadvantage to, uh, to, uh, because they weren't raised in a community that, that was saturated in scriptural truth. And similarly, if we distance ourselves from real in-person Christian community and friendships, we can find ourselves ignorant of truth as we uh, cherry-pick our teachers from books and online resources, not allowing our ideas in conversation to bounce off those who are different from us and see things differently from us. The reality, as stated before, is that in Christ, all believers are one 
people group, all with the same access to God through the Holy Spirit. Uh, we may each stifle our relationship with God at times and, and in different ways, but we all have the same graciously unhindered access to God as far as he is concerned. We are also all purposed with significance as citizens of his kingdom and intimate partners of his kingdom plans. Whether we take advantage of that partnership uh, or not, we all have that unified purpose. So then, how do we contribute to unity in our local churches? I think it starts by sort of leaning into that squirm that we tend to want to just, by reflex, avoid. Um, to lean into that, lean into the discomfort of precarious social situations and conversations, taking with us a trust that God really has fresh and untiring grace for us every moment. And that despite our weakness and what people may think of us, God values us enormously and has a grand purpose for us in those situations where our weakness may show. Um, in fact, Paul himself said, when I am weak, then I am strong, because that's when Christ's power is, is made perfect. It's made complete. That's when it can really be displayed and be shown. When I am at my weakness, that's when God amazingly still does uh, incredible things. And so we really, I think, the first thing we want to do is make ourselves available for those kinds of situations, trusting in the grace and the forgiveness of God through those. But what about when our local churches either neglect us out of just discomfort and ignorance and not knowing what to do with us, or maybe even condemn us for unbiblical reasons? How do we contribute to unity in our local church then? First, I want to make a distinction between the leadership um, of a local church and the local church body. If the leadership of the church condemns what it should not, that's an issue to take up with the leadership itself. Um, and if we don't know, if we're uncertain, based on pulpit preaching, where our leaders stand on issues related to the entertainment that we are interested in, then it's worthwhile to send an email or just you know meet at Starbucks uh, with a pastor or elder or leader, wh whatever the leadership structure is at your church, to meet with them, to, to put the topic on the table and kind of see where uh, the church is at on some of those things. I cannot tell you how much more excited I am to serve at my church having done that, knowing that the leaders have no issues with people enjoying Dungeons and Dragons and Harry Potter or any number of other entertainment forms. Knowing that for certain, having talked to my leaders about it, has freed me up to explore numerous ways that I can serve while incorporating the strengths and passions, sometimes even the geek interests that uh, I I'm just wired to have. Um, if, however, your church leaders condemn what should not be condemned and refuse to change their position in light of Scripture, they are then adding to God's words. And this is not a local church that should be supported by your giving or service. In that case, I would be happy to try and help you find a genuine Bible teaching church uh, in your area. If your church supports, uh, your church leadership supports your enjoyment of entertainment that doesn't cause or tempt you to sin, but there are those in the church body who condemn or criticize you for those things, this is where, again, remembering grace is vital, not finding our identity and approval in others, but in the approval God has for us through the sacrifice of Christ and the untiring grace he has to apply that sacrifice to us again and again freshly every moment. Um, that's where grace is so vital. Um, in verses 1 through 10 of Ephesians chapter 2, Paul took pains to remind readers of their need for the rescue of Jesus. We cannot afford to harden ourselves to those who sin against us, because God does not harden himself against us, but offers tireless, undeserved, favorable treatment. That's the meaning of the word grace. Christ is our unifying common ground. And that's something that we also need to remember coming into those difficult interactions with uh, other members of the church. Um, when someone judges us unfairly, we should immediately try to remember that although uh, the geek interests they are concerned about are not really sin, we do have other areas in our lives that are sinful, that they're not even mentioning. We do desperately need Jesus. And not just for past sins, but for sin in our lives right now. Sin that we haven't recognized yet. Um, and remembering our own sin and our need for Jesus removes the power of those who condemn us. Because those concerned, quote-unquote, Christians don't even know half of the reasons we need Jesus. And Jesus has provided forgiveness for all of it. Uh, secondly, the fact that they are judging us unfairly indicates that they need Jesus too. 
It's a reminder that they need Jesus too. Their their, uh, perhaps passionately unbiblical opinions should be recognized as weakness. Uh, And not so that we can smugly think to ourselves, oh, they're wrong and I'm right, they're immature, I am clearly the more mature and knowledgeable and discerning of Scripture. That's not the the mentality we're meant to have. That's just us being judgmental in response to their judgment. Instead, that recognition of weakness on their part should trigger genuine, heartfelt compassion for them to maybe consider, wow, how could they have arrived at this place? And I wonder what kinds of difficult things they have suffered under the teaching that led them to that conclusion, you know. Um, There's just different ways that we can kind of put our, uh, not just our imagination, but our attempts at speculation and and deduction, not that we want to assume that our speculation is right, but just in in a way that's favorable toward them and that stimulates compassion for them. Consider what may have been the case that would lead them to this false and uh, legalistic view of, of matters of entertainment. Um, that, that helps us develop compassion for them and, um, and develops in us the recognition that, gosh, maybe God has placed me in this conversation, in this moment, or in this relationship with this person so that I can be of help to them in some way. Uh, This is an area I've been slowly growing in since entering the YouTube arena where (laughs) the ugliest side of humanity and Christianity seems to show up to leave comments. Um, The outrageous and just nonsensical rantings of, you know, in comments, those are the first and easiest forms of judgment for me to develop tolerance to because it's just like, wow, really clear, like they are coming from some kind of a dark place. I can't imagine what's going on there. Um... But now I'm, I've also been developing compassion for those Christians who unbiblically, although they would say biblically, uh, object in more subtly prideful and passive-aggressive ways. And that can get under my skin a little bit more easily, but even in that I've been growing as I've been discerning, stripping away falsehood and looking for the core truth that's in someone's passive-aggressive, you know, or kind of condescending words. Um, and finding compassion for people even in those more more difficult and nuanced situations. The key, I think, Paul teaches here is recognizing that common ground of grace and forgiveness that we have in Christ, which should lead us to look at the mess we and others make, the wounds we all inflict on each other, and say, Jesus, please come quickly to rescue. We are just making a mess of it all. Um, and then, once we've gained the right perspective and gotten at least some handle on our defensiveness, that's the time to invite our judges to sit down so they can share where they're coming from, specifically as it relates to Scripture. Uh, it might even be good to include a member of church leadership uh, in the conversation. With the support of our leaders and a recognition of our universal need for grace, we can recognize openly the potential pitfalls in some forms of geek entertainment, uh, while also sharing the truth of the freedom and grace that we all have in Christ. If you would like some help finding a good church in your area, I would love to help you do that if I can. Online resources and communities are good supplements, but by their very nature, they can't speak to your particular situation like relationships in a local church can. The context for almost everything in the New Testament assumes that we are serving and building purposeful relationships in a local church. So uh, whether you're in a church that lacks Bible-based intentionality or maybe not attending any church at all right now, Uh, If I can help you get connected to an authentic, compassionate, Bible-oriented church, I would love to do that. Email me, please, P-A-E-T-E-R at spiritblade.com, and uh, we can try to look at some websites of churches in your area together.